here's something fun to do while in lockdown. Watch a cartoon series based on a movie where the main character was in literal lockdown for the first 17 years of her life. Kind of puts things into perspective a bit, doesn't it? For those of you looking for another series to binge on while in lockdown, might I recommend, unironically mind you, Rapunzel's Tangled Adventure. First airing on the Disney Channel in 2017, this series is set six months after the 2010 CGI movie Tangled and follows Rapunzel as she attempts to adjust to her new life as the princess of the Kingdom of Corona. I mean, um, the beautiful Kingdom of Miller's Genuine Draft. Not a sponsor. The show has a continuous plot throughout the series revolving around Rapunzel and her handmaiden Cassandra coming across these mysterious black rocks that, when touched, restored Rapunzel's long blonde hair. Oddly enough, though, she didn't regain the magic the hair once held. But as the movie's ending implied, the magic wasn't in her hair anyway, but was in fact inside her. The series goes much deeper into the lore of where the magic came from originally and what happened to the sundrop flower after it was picked to save Rapunzel's mother. The series follows the mystery of the Black Rocks and how their magic and Rapunzel's is linked. There are many brilliant episodes I could cover in this series, but there's one in particular that intrigued me more than any other, and that would be the episode entitled Painter's Block. This episode in particular is a filler episode, more or less, or a breather episode, and considering the subject matter being about artist block, I thought it would be fitting to do a video on it. I've covered artist block as a subject before on my channel, and I do enjoy enjoy animated shows referencing this, but it is often as a B-plot or is just not treated with much seriousness. Not only does this episode tackle artist block head on, but it touches on the mental torture and stress it can cause. Alright, so yeah, it still doesn't give it the seriousness it needs, but that's due to time restraints, I guess. Not to mention it is actually used as part of an evil plot conjured up by a one-off villain. Breather episodes can usually be skipped over if they don't add anything to the main running story, I guess, and yeah. You could say that this episode could be skipped, but breather episodes like this do actually provide something necessary, the time to ramp up the peril the protagonists are actually in. Though breather episodes like this can be really overbearing, and yeah, this episode is a little bit to me, but you need episodes like this to provide a buffer so things don't get too dark. You know, provide a lighter and softer tone. Uh, <laughs> never mind. The episode serves as a break partway through a sequence of pretty intense episodes, but this episode also is one of the darker ones from the show, ironically enough, in spite of it being a filler episode. The episode starts off by summarising the events in the series so far, also showing this episode's villain, Sugarbee, a ghostly old hag spirit escaping her entrapment during a hurricane. It then shows Rapunzel eating an apple while walking through the palace. Symbolism, I guess. Her father, King Frederick, is building an art gallery to contain artwork to represent all seven kingdoms and asks Rapunzel to paint a mural for the gallery. Rapunzel, of course, jumps at the chance and sets to work. Or tries to. Let's admit it, for an artist, any artist, painting a mural for an art gallery is a dream project. I mean, yeah, okay, this opportunity has sort of been handed to Rapunzel on a silver platter with no real effort, but you can't deny that Rapunzel is a talented artist. Being unable to decide what to paint after staring at the blank canvas for so long, she goes to her friends for help and they suggest that what she needs is inspiration and a change of scenery. Maybe what she needs is a little inspiration. That's it. Come on, Pascal. Let's go find some real inspiration. She walked right past the smolder. She's worse than we thought. <laughs> yeah, here's hoping Eugene can get over the fact that the smolder does not exactly inspire Rapunzel in any way. He just runs past him to find inspiration elsewhere. Maybe he should try blue steel. Yeah, I made a Zoolander reference. It was only a matter of time. Rapunzel then makes the mistake of looking at what everyone else is painting. I say it's a mistake because you end up comparing yourself and your own abilities to others and that can result in self-doubt, making the artist block 100 times worse and can drown out creativity and result in the inability to tap into inspiration altogether. Yeah, inspiration is a fickle thing. Life is full of tough choices. Isn't it, dear? Yeah, you know you're in bad company when a stranger quotes a line from an iconic Disney villain. Life's full of tough choices, isn't it? 
are good company because, you know, declaring Disney quotes at every given opportunity is a must for breaking the ice in social situations. Trust me, try it. Say a Disney quote in a large crowd and the person who finishes it for you is your kind of person. Trust me, it's how I've made friends for most of my life. But maybe not in this particular case. So anyway, Sugar Bee, while in disguise as an elderly woman, runs an art class where she sets her students the challenge of painting a rather drab and boring looking tree sapling that looks half dead. But Rapunzel being Rapunzel strives to see the inner beauty in the subject and attempts to paint anyway. Sugar Bee, however, encourages her to paint the tree precisely how she sees it instead of how she feels about it. Often, painter's block happens when you haven't processed recent errors errors in judgment you made or some trauma hasn't been addressed. And this is for sure the case for Rapunzel. Though this is a filler episode, it does reference previous plot points and decisions she made for the safety of her kingdom in previous episodes. A good example would be when she had to break her promise to Varian that she would help him save his father when she had to put the safety of her kingdom first during a state of emergency. Yeah, the one thing good about this series is that it actually shows royals doing their duties and making hard decisions. While Rapunzel is drawing a blank, Sugarbee mentions her experience of seeing artists block many times before and talks about how all artists put their own spin on the subjects they paint and how putting your own spin on things can lead to overthinking. Which is true in a way. Sometimes when you overcomplicate the process of creativity by wondering how your art will stand out from others, it can block the creative flow. Obviously, Sugar Bee has ulterior motives by convincing Rapunzel to just paint the tree exactly how she sees it, but it genuinely bothers me how Rapunzel doesn't fight her corner here. Realists and expressionists have different approaches when it comes to art. One wants to replicate the subject as realistically as possible as a show of skill, whereas an expressionist like Rapunzel, though also having the knowledge and ability to draw realistically, is more about showing her emotional response to the subject. Neither approaches are wrong, but to manipulate an artist into painting in a way that doesn't come natural to them seems a little controlling and it surprises me that Rapunzel doesn't argue with Sugar Bee here. But then, she's not the kind of person to argue, especially with someone who is her senior. So maybe she didn't argue with her out of respect. I don't know. You'd think that Rapunzel would be able to recognise when she's being manipulated or coerced like this, since, you know, Mother Gothel did the same thing to her for 17 years. But then, she is the kind of person to see the good in everyone first. It's revealed that people in the kingdom of Co- uh, I mean, um, Miller's genuine draft are going missing. And we see it's because Sugar Bee is recruiting victims to paint a tree that is imprisoning the demon and main antagonist of the series, Zantiri. Over time, as she recruits more and more people to paint the tree, the weaker the prison becomes and slowly a portal begins to open. Sugar Bee is one of many of Zantiri's minions and is probably the creepiest of them all to me because of how she uses creativity and the skill of painting to unlock the prison. But it's also because of how manipulative she is toward Rapunzel. Using painting, realism, no less, to set a demon free? That's actually pretty inventive, if a little confusing. What unlocks the demon? The painting itself? The replicative painting? The inspiration used? Or the inspiration tapped into? I don't know, it's a little vague. But it's still genuinely creepy. Rapunzel, to me, is definitely not a realist, by any means. She's more inclined to paint and draw how she feels about her subject, having a more impressionistic style to her illustrations. I guess she wanted to prove to herself that she could paint realistically, but she fails and instead hits a brick wall. What's the matter? Drawing a blank. What was I talking about again? Oh yeah, <laughs> drawing a blank. Because... Ironically, there is nothing scarier to the artist than a blank canvas because it's figuratively demanding you to make a decision which can make or break your next art piece. When you repress, you depress. To impress, you must express. Creativity is all about experimenting, asking questions, making decisions. And sometimes art block happens when we simply aren't able to decide what to focus on or what to do and then we start to overthink things. Sugar Bee seems to encompass a lot of classic Disney villain tropes similar to Ursula and Maleficent and maybe even the old hag from Snow White as well. Who, by the way, I consider to be the scariest Disney villain, even 80 years after the release of Snow White. God, she's terrifying. It's interesting that Sugar Bee's advice about art block is based on truth in a way. When villains have 
an inarguable logic and are able to manipulate you into thinking they are right, you know you have a good villain on your hands. Sugar Bee is the perfect example of the bad Samaritan archetype, though admittedly this series does have a lot of those, but I'm not going to insult your intelligence by telling the story of the good Samaritan here. I think everyone is familiar with that biblical proverb by now, but if you're not, here's a quick summary for the sake of context. A good Samaritan provides help to anyone in need, even a complete stranger. Stranger. They will come across the wounded hero and take them in, feed them and tend to their injuries without asking for anything in return. Sometimes these people are punished for their goodness because they were a horrible judge of character and chose to help someone who would only repay them with evil. A good example of this would be when Snow White takes pity on the old hag only for the hag to poison her later. The bad Samaritan is someone who takes in the hero and seems at first to be helping, all to do the hero harm in the end. They don't act out of the kindness of their own heart but by some villainous motivation. They will keep their intentions hidden from the victim and sometimes this is hidden from the audience as well. Well, gaining their trust until they have the hero helpless. Sometimes relying on the kindness of strangers is not always a good thing. A mask of altruism or wolf in sheep's clothing here. This character can often be sympathetic, a uh, flawed but well-intentioned character. Though in this case, definitely not well-intentioned. This kind of villain usually maintains a friendly and courteous mask, even as they commit incredibly heinous acts, just as Shukabi is doing. An affably evil villain will treat the hero like a friend genuinely regretting having to fight them and seriously trying to win them over. A false affably evil villain will say, you know I always look forward to our little meetings, while gruesomely torturing them for fun. Ursula is more laughably evil, as she's a villain who is funny rather than polite, though it is nice to see the nod to her in this episode, as she does also wear a mask or disguise to fulfil her goal. An old villain lures their much younger victim by giving an image of a wise and caring and soft-spoken old woman or man, only to drop the mask and showing their true colours as soon as their target is vulnerable, just like Sugarbee does during the ritual around the tree. These villains usually rely on using pet names like child or sweetheart or sweetie or something to strengthen the bond with their prey, just like Sugarbee does here. The usual operation is to give their victims a glimmer of hope and yank the chain soon after. Among the main goals of this habit can be counted blackmailing, getting richer or soul body sealing like in this case, or more simply just simple pleasure in hurting others. An evil smirk or a Freudian slip or a traitor shot are often used to remind the audience that this villain is just biding their time and has no intention of mending their ways. This is when a villain wears a mask of altruism and pretends that their goal is to help the unfortunate needy characters. Ursula is a perfect example of this. They will befriend and offer them their assistance to win them over, secretly using them as pawns in their scheme. Good guys usually don't catch on until it is way too late to do anything about it, and the villain has just put the final touches on their plot, revealing that the help was merely part of the evil plan all along. This sort of plot usually comes up when the hero wants something and is desperate enough to do anything to get it. Rapunzel in this case simply wants to break out of her artist block. The villain has just what the doctor ordered and is willing to give it to the hero for a price. And the price is always exactly what the villain needs to achieve their goal. The hero might have to give up something important to the villain or may have to retrieve a plot coupon or something. Other times the villain will maintain a cover of respectability and generosity like in this case with Sugarby, in order to attract good guys who later unwittingly act as mooks for the villain's cause. And sometimes the villain is simply a cruel insert profanity here and likes corrupting the thought of kindness by turning it into villainy. Either way, in the end, it turns out that by accepting their assistance, the protagonist has been unwittingly playing right into the villain's hands. This episode is a lot more disturbing than it really needs to be. I think this episode feels creepy to me because of how relatable Rapunzel's predicament really is. Rapunzel represents the earnest creator to me. And creation requires some sort of passion for what is being made, so when that passion is gone, on, so is the will to create. So when these creative types become emotionally wrecked, the passion tends to leave, or at least it feels like it's left, and you just don't want to do anything. Or worse, you want to destroy what you've created. Your ability to create just leaves entirely, or like I've just said, 
it feels like it's left. And even if you make an effort, you'll find you just can't do it. Not in the way that you could before, at the very least. This is especially likely if the breakdown was caused by something related to the creation itself. Which in this case, it's not but I think you understand what I'm getting at. A character who is under the influence of hypnotism or mind control, like in this episode, will show the influence in their eyes, or with a visual change at least. This is mostly for the benefit of the audience, really. While people around the character may note they're acting a little funny or out of character, usually nobody in the universe ever notices the change itself. The standard signal for mind control or possession in these kind of episodes is totally black or totally white eyes. In many Western cartoons and comics, hypnosis is represented by the eyes appearing as swirling spirals or concentric circles, but that idea is kind of a little bit dated nowadays, at least in my opinion. Sometimes it's also represented by changes in the dilation of the pupil. You know, the pupil will either get really small or really large. The inversion of something only they would say, like when a character is pretending to be someone else, they unwittingly reveal this by saying something that would be out of character for who they're impersonating. Sugar Bay hypnotizes Rapunzel and the other civilians of Kuroa, I mean uh, Miller's genuine draft, and the paintings they create somehow unlock the trap that imprisons Zantiri, the series' main protagonist. And when Eugene and Cassandra confront Shugabi, she reveals her true form as Shugatra, the Eternal. In an attempt to trap Rapunzel further in the hypnotic trance, I'm just gonna call her Shugabi. Shugabi tells her she'll no longer have to make difficult choices ever again. This actually snaps Rapunzel out of the trance because she remembers that making difficult choices are a part of life, whether she is a princess or not. She destroys the painting and ruins the ceremony. This results in closing the portal before Santiri can escape and Shugabi also gets thrown back into the portal. The ending of the episode shows that Rapunzel has asked the other artists to paint the mural along with her, curing her artist block. So I wanted to talk about this episode because it explores Rapunzel's interest for art and also has a much darker tone than any of the filler episodes of the show. Yeah, filler episodes can be annoying, especially when a show has too many of them, like this show does, but it's still a show I recommend. The 2D animation is pretty nice and high quality, and the writing is consistent and on par with the movie in sophistication and detail, and the characters themselves are not dumbed down like they often are from their movie versions. I do have some hang-ups on the series, but I'll maybe get into that in another video. Painter's Block is one of those episodes that is way more memorable of how strange and dark it is compared to the rest of the series, and I highly recommend you guys check it out. Let me know what you think of the show in the comments below, and if you want me to cover this show again, yeah, let me know. I'm Mad Munchkin, stay creative.